Wiring a Winning Software Organization with Gene Kim. The Azure DevOps Podcast is a show for developers and DevOps professionals shipping software using Microsoft technologies. Each show brings you hard-hitting interviews with industry experts, innovating better methods, and sharing success stories. Listen on to learn how to increase quality, ship quickly, and operate well. And now your host, Jeffrey Palermo. Welcome to the show. I'm Jeffrey Palermo, your host for helping you and your teams move fast and deliver quality and to run your software with confidence in Azure, all while using everything that the .NET ecosystem has to offer. The podcast is sponsored by ClearMeasure, which is a full-service software architecture and engineering firm that serves companies that are building mission-critical software systems. Quick announcement, we are in the second year of my Software Architect Forums. Um, You can sign up for the next session at the link in the show notes or go to clearmeasure.com for that. And we've also launched a new executive software leadership forum for technical executives who oversee software engineering groups from CTOs, VP of engineering, any any manager, executive level that is, is tasked for overseeing software groups. We understand there's tons of learning opportunities for individual programmers. You can just go online and watch videos. But for people who are running organizations, either at the the architect level or at the executive level, it's a little bit harder. There's not as many opportunities. And so these are peer groups. We're getting people together who face similar challenges and talk about it. So I facilitate and I, I have each month a different topic. And we all rally around that topic and share success success stories and ask and answer questions and help each other get better. So You can go to clearmeasure.com and sign up for either one of those, depending on uh, what your role is. And for those of you who are looking for programming with Palermo, my video podcast, you can just search for it in any of the directories and you'll be able to find it. My guest today on the show is Gene Kim. Gene has been studying high-performing technology organizations since 1999. He was the founder and CTO of Tripwire, Inc., which uh, for 13 years, Uh, which is an enterprise security software company. His books have sold over a million copies. Um, He's a Wall Street Journal bestselling author, most recently co-authored Wiring the Winning Organization, as well as another book, The Phoenix Project, another book, The DevOps Handbook, and the Shingo Publication award-winning Accelerate book. Um, And since 2014, he's been the organizer and program chair of DevOps Enterprise Summit, studying the technology transformations of large, complex organizations, uh, now called the Enterprise Technology Leadership Summit. And you can find his website at itrevolution.com. Gene, welcome to the podcast. How are you, sir? Oh, Jeffrey, I'm doing great. And uh, thank you for having me on. And congratulations on like all the amazing podcasts that uh, you recorded. And I'm delighted to join (laughs) the pantheon of people that uh, you've had on your show. Oh, my pleasure. I'm I'm, I'm excited to have you on uh, because uh, in, in, in myself, in my circle, uh, all of my engineers at work, we've all read your books and we've all benefited <laughs> from that. And so, uh, I want every listener of this podcast just to, you know, to understand if you haven't, I'm talking to the listener now, if you haven't at least read the Phoenix project, the DevOps handbook, like get started. Um, hmm. they're, they're so good. They're so, they're quick reads. And now I'm giving you the commercial, but that's, that's what I think. They're so easy to read. By the way, the material is just presented in story format, and it's been a, a, a huge help. So you've helped a ton of people in the industry just by your writing, and I'm glad that you released another book in, in 23 um, to keep that going. Oh, right on. Yeah, in fact, um, can I tell you a little bit about uh, maybe why? <laughs> like, why another book? Uh, which is uh, Please do. Uh, I love that phrase. Um, I, I hate writing, but I love having written. Uh, was that Mark yeah. Twain <laughs> who said that? Oh, but, uh, yeah, yeah um, I, it was. Uh, came out of a sense of just uh, genuine desire to understand something better. Or actually, maybe I should just uh, rewind just a little bit. Uh, yeah, so I've been studying high performing technology organizations for twenty five years, and uh, you know, one of the unexpected things that happened was that it uh, took me into the middle of the DevOps movement. Uh, so that was in twenty ten. And so uh, the Phoenix Project is really, um, it's been amazing to see how that book has 
really turned into kind of like a rallying banner of like, you know, how do you find the kindred spirits who are just really sick and tired of doing softer, the bad old ways, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing wrong with the old ways, but if it's old and bad, right, it's yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, particularly excruciating. And one of the neat things that happened uh, out of that was uh, then working on a project called the uh, State of DevOps Research. Um, so that was Dr. with Dr. Nicole Forsgren and just Humble. And uh, that was this amazing um, uh, study that spanned six years and 36,000 respondents. And uh, the goal was to really understand what does high performance look like? And uh, what are the behaviors, norms, uh, technical practices that uh, you know predict high performance? And so uh, it was just amazing just to be able to uh, generate some, you know, actual quantifiable data, right? Just like how the uh, uh, the cross population instrument is what the medical community used to establish the link between smoking and early morbidity and mortality. So we use the same mm -hmm. instrument to be able to say, oh, look, hey, you know, uh, these high performers, you know, they deploy more frequently, they have far better outcomes, they have better security, they're better at achieving business goals. And you know, there's like really, you know, three things that uh, predict performance. One was, uh, you know, the technical practices like CICD, uh, you know, fast feedback. Uh, the other one was uh, architectural practices, right? Uh, you know, the mark of a great architect is, you know, to what degree can uh, architecture enable independence of action, right? And then the third one is cultural mm -hmm. norms. Um, uh, is, uh, uh, I think the best verbalization of that was uh, around the doctor, uh, the Western organizational typology model. You know, pathological versus bureaucratic versus generative. Ooh. There was still this lingering mystery, which was, you know, uh, you know, in the DevOps community, we often, you know, uh, cite the lean principles. You know, we cite resilience engineering, and so it sort of leads us kind of very kind of uncomfortable questions, like what really is in common between agile, DevOps, lean, you know, mm -hmm. uh, safety culture, and so forth. And uh, so uh, the book really came out of this. Uh, decade-long collaboration with uh, a mentor of mine, Dr. Steven Spear, uh, from the MIT Sloan School of Business, who wrote the uh, most widely downloaded Harvard Business Review article of all time called Decoding oh, wow. the DNA of the Toyota Production System. Right? And so that was okay. actually based on his uh, doctoral dissertation that he did at the Harvard Business School, where he worked on the plant uh, floor of a tier one Toyota supplier for six months. And so uh, it was just, uh, you know, we spent three years, uh, you know, really starting to really ask the question, like what, what really is in common between all these methodologies and frameworks and so forth. And our conclusion was that uh, they are all incomplete expressions of a far greater, but also simpler whole. And, you know, our, uh, the thesis really was that, you know, when you look at any of these frameworks, or if you look at Conway's law, you could look at um, team topologies, really, there's really only three mechanisms at work. And we call them slowification, simplification, and amplification. And really, you can derive them all just by asking, you know, the question like, you know, under describe the conditions where it is the most difficult to solve problems. Uh, one, you make it really fast paced. You make it mm -hmm. really, um, you take away any ability to undo or redo. <laughs> you make every yeah. mistake, even no matter how small it is, cascade out and cause global catastrophic failures, <laughs> right? Which makes, you know, learning impossible because you can't iterate and you make no time to sharpen the saw, right? And so really... Yeah. Um, when you sort of explore the opposite end of, uh, you know, th those conditions, it means that you can, you know, uh, do your most dangerous consequential work, not in production, but instead do them in planning and practice. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you make time, you know, to improve daily work. And maybe it's even more important than daily work itself. Um, and you change the nature of uh, uh, the actual problems themselves that you take, you know, these kind of highly coupled problems that, where one mistake in one place can cause mistakes in distant parts of the system, you, you separate them and out and partition them so that, you know, not only does it sort of contain the blast radius, but it enables independence of action. <laughs> so that's, you know, people can actually work independently of uh, each other. And then, mm -hmm. you know, there's actually a, um, a similar one that's for, for parallel processes. You know, there's one for sequential processes, which is that you linearize them so that, uh, again, you can, uh, you know, CICD is a great example that you can decouple the work of developers versus the security engineers versus the ops engineers uh, yeah. and, and enable also independence of action. And then the last one is amplification, you know, make it uh, so that even small uh, signals of failure, the weakest signals of failure can be amplified uh, so that they can be acted upon to either prevent, you know, or detect and correct. And so just the notion that, you know, this really those three kind of mechanisms that really show up in like everywhere, not just in software architecture and uh, 
software design and operations, but also, you know, in lean safety culture and so forth. Anyway, how, how am I doing so far? Yeah, well, that's that's a really great rundown of the new book. And I want to I have some questions about those three specifically. Before we go into that, can we back up a little bit? Even you know, before you started writing, are there any, what are the moments in your career that are kind of formative that, that led you to what you're doing today? Yeah, great question. So, uh, you know, actually my first book was called The Visible Ops Handbook. It came out in 2004 and it was all about creating world-class security and operations, you know, in four practical steps in, in ITIL, right? And so, uh, you know, uh, some people sort of laugh at ITIL these days, but I mean, uh, back then it was it was a revelation, right? There's like uh, mm -hmm. many uh, ops organizations, uh, uh, there was no notion of, uh, you know, what ticketing was for and, you know, how do you use ticketing for the, uh, uh, you know, resolution, um, incident resolution processes. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think kind of the big insight was that uh, those organizations that had the best security were the ones that had the best working relationship with operations and vice versa, right? That there, there were common practices and processes that, you know, they need to integrate into. And and so um, uh, that, that was actually a huge insight in terms of kind of this, for me, starting the journey of studying high-performing organizations. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, by the time, you know, uh, you can't get very far in that discussion uh, before you realize that there's some other missing stakeholder called development, <laughs> right? Who also has to be a part of that uh, collaboration. And so, uh, by the time that uh, revelation came, that was around uh, 2005, 2006. Uh, and I think just seeing kind of the uh, uh, the failures that would happen when you know development is uh, working in isolation. And the first time the ops people see it is, uh, you know, a week before the deployment and just seeing the you know, mayhem and uh, catastrophes that would result. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, that was, I think, the common experience of almost everyone who found themselves, you know, in the DevOps movement. <laughs> and so when I in my first DevOps days in 2010, I mean, it was just uh, my feeling was, oh my gosh, I found my tribe, right? And right. You know, that became a group of people that uh, I had start, started working very heavily with and uh, so much informed. Um, the Phoenix Project was, uh, I think, uh, already you know, probably 10 years in, right? And so it came out in 2013. Um, but, uh, you know, so much of that was informed by, you know, those amazing things happening kind of in those early days of, uh, you know, companies large and small, you know, trying mm -hmm. to figure out a better way to do things. Uh, right. How am I doing? You programmed, you know, for, for quite a bit before then, yeah. like 2004 or some, you've been thinking about how to make programming teams better for a really long time, right? Yeah, but, although back then it was all about like the, the, op, the poor ops people and the poor security well, yeah. people. Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, for sure. <laughs> well, how to, how to just... How to do software better. You're right. If, if yeah. ops and developers, they're not even talking together, things aren't going to go yeah. right. But just building software, putting it in the hands of the user, that whole process, it's got to be done well. And there's all kinds of ways for it to be chaotic and broken. Yes. And 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 you've been thinking about that for a long time. Um, and a lot's happened in that time frame that like the from 2001 on, the agile movement, and then and then uh cloud uh became a big thing, and then DevOps basically filled in. Uh, and said, I think there's some gaps here. Yeah, Agile this and Cloud that, but <laughs> hey, wait a minute, there's some stuff that's missing. And and so in your in in the three points, which I think are brilliant, solidification, simplification, amplification, is any of your thought process a replacement of some of the things, or is it a categorization of some of the practices that that the industry's kind of figured out over these movements? Yeah, uh, I think I think it's definitely the second, right? It's basically um, you know uh, sort of. Beyond the industry kind of treatment of like, you know, physical manufacturing and lean and uh, software uh, development and, you know, whether Scrum XP and so forth, right? Really, what are the uh, underlying mechanisms that are in common, right? And so, uh, but yeah, you know, I'll tell you like what some of the big aha moments uh, that came out of working with uh, uh, Dr. Steven Spear was that maybe the, maybe the question is like, why? <laughs> why is it, uh, you know, uh, even more necessary now more than ever, you know, to, you know, look at, these principles and practices. And for me, one of the big, you know, just genuine gobsmacking moments was, you know, looking at healthcare organizations. So like one of the things that I'm really mm -hmm. proud of in the Wearing the Winning Organization book is that there's 24 case studies of which 20% are technology related, you know, only 20%. Mm -hmm. The one that, uh, you know, some of them are aviation, some of them is like uh, space flight, some of it's, uh, but the, the largest category of case studies are in uh, healthcare, specifically emergency departments. And so, uh, like there's really two big revelations. One is that 
life was much simpler <laughs> when we didn't have very many functional specialties. Uh, and so in the book, we introduced this construct saying that's really three layers of work. Layer one is like the, the work and the object in front of us. It could be the code uh, that we're working on or the binary that's running in production or the patient. Uh, layer two is the tools and technologies. So that's you know the IDE that we're editing the code in, or it could be the Kubernetes platform, or it could be the MRI machine, the CAT scanner, you know, uh, the blood you know, tracers. Uh, and level th layer three is really about the social circuitry, the organizational wiring. And what's astonishing is that, you know, if you take a look at like any sort of DevOps case study, in general, right, the only thing that changed is in layer three, right? In other words, the same people, same, same equipment, you know, same floor space, same managers, right? You know, the only thing that changes is, you know, the software architecture. Uh, it could be a little bit of automation, right? But in general, Right, uh, whether you're talking about the Numi plant in uh, you know Fremont, California, or you know the safety culture at Alcoa, right? What's in common is that the difference maker is in layer three, right? It's uh, it's uh, so it says you know, uh, and in our world, right? Layer three is the software architecture. It's you know the how we structure teams and mm -hmm. uh, uh, the team of teams. It's, you know who's allowed to talk to who about what and when, <laughs> right? So uh, so the aha moment. So. Uh, emergency departments in healthcare are just notorious for just um, like how accident prone they are, right? No one has what they need when they need it, right? And, uh, you know, the outcomes are that, you know, there's accidents and injuries and, uh, uh, you know, all sorts of terrible things. But it wasn't always that way uh, that, you know, in the 1950s, there was actually a far safer system. And uh, the mm. conjecture is that it's only because there was re really, it was a far simpler system. You had Basically, at layer one, you had doctors and nurses. Mm. Uh, you had very little technology. You, know, you had extra machines, which aren't very high tempo. Uh, right. So you could get away with a very simple layer three wiring. So you fast forward 70 years, uh, and you take a look at the explosion of functional specialties. You have like 20 different functional specialties just among clinicians. You have mm -hmm. nurses, supply chain, pharmacy, right? Uh, then you have technology at right? layer two, right? It's not just extra machines. It's you know, MRIs and uh, CAT scanners. And you have like EMR systems and so forth. So just consider like how much more complicated and sophisticated the layer three wiring has to be, right? And so mm -hmm. kind of the big takeaway for me was that, you know, as you increase the number of functional specialties, you have to have an ever more sophisticated layer three organizational wiring. Um, and done poorly, you end up with, you know, and no one has independence of action. You have, uh, uh, you know, small errors creating catastrophic, uh, you know, consequences. For me, it just shows like in our world, like just look at how many more functional specialties we have. It's not just .NET and Java. Now it's containers. It's Kubernetes. It's a uh, oh, mm -hmm. Gen AI, prompt engineering, ML ops. <laughs> it's just like you know, consider like as a as an architect and as a leader, right? Uh, how much more careful we need to be, right, about uh, finding kind of like um, you know who should talk to who when, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you know, even the way we talk about like Conway's law and team topologies, I think it just shows that really you know, um, our attention should be focused on layer three. How am I doing here, Jeffrey? That's a fascinating way to look at it. Do you find, is there any rule of thumb emerging, emerging where one should uh, attempt to have fewer functional specialties or not? Or is that just a recognition of the environment? Yeah, oh, what a, what a great question. Um, in fact, I guess conjecture number one is we should have fewer functional specialties, but you know, I now self-identify as a developer, whereas like for decades, my, my real love was infrastructure and operations. But yeah. now as a developer who just wants to ship my you know feature that solves my problem, there's all these things I don't want to deal with. Like, for example, anything outside of my application, like mm -hmm. connecting to databases and secrets management and right. uh, CICD pipelines and uh, YAML files and um, cloud mm -hmm. costs and PubSub coffee cues, right? Like, like, literally, I don't care. I mean, I know they're important, but it is, um, you know, I my the feelings that those um, things evoke in me is like uh, frustration, uh, maybe some anger, right? It's like, uh, why do I, these are things that are probably important. I know are important, especially security, but they're like not what I woke up in the morning wanting to do, right? Yeah. You <laughs> so, want it to uh, be taken care of, but you want somebody else to take care of it. So then the, then the, then the decision is okay can i can i get it can i get something that's commoditized so it's taken care of versus hire yet another person in my team who is that functional specialist oh totally totally in fact i mean just a recent story i was uh, trying to 
uh, do some um, uh, image to text stuff on uh, yeah. uh, on an LLM. And I didn't want to do it on my laptop. And uh, so I went into Google Cloud and uh, was then trying to figure out like, um, you know, was then prompted with, uh, you know, 24 different GPUs. And like, sure. I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure how much I care. Right? Yeah. I, I do yeah. care about cost. You know, two hours later, I'm like, screw it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I couldn't get the drivers working. I couldn't get like the uh, oh, uh, the load right. monitors working. And uh, you know, at this point, how awesome would it be to just have a friend, uh, or better yet, a person whose job it is to sort of create these, uh, you know, uh, uh, VMs that just have it working already, <laughs> right? Yeah, and I think this right. is where, um, you know, uh, these days, um, you know, this is where large organizations I think have an have an advantage over small organizations because. When you're sufficiently small or a solo developer, right, you have to do it all, right? Mm -hmm. And and so uh, I think one of the affordances that uh, larger software organizations get to have is they can bring to bear these uh, functional specialties. Uh, a friend of mine was just talking about how um, this person probably for the last 15 years have written too many grants, start out star to user start out star, right? They're just okay. someday wanting, promising to fix it, <laughs> right? But how great would it be just to have a database functional specialist that could just help, you know, uh, do it right. Uh, does that resonate with yeah. any of your experiences? It, it does. What it makes me think of is um, the architectural choices and this concept of latency versus low, la low latency in people. And the, the agile, the early agile movement said, anybody that needs to do work, put them in the same team, co-located, even grab a customer and have everybody there, but with a growing number of functional specialties, whether they're at a vendor, whether it's, you know, Azure takes care of it, but then we need like some Azure specialist for the, <laughs> the hard yeah. stuff. Uh, yeah. We're not going to, and especially in the last five years with tons of remote people and whatnot, fewer and fewer organizations have everybody in the room, every, you know, every specialist all the time. And so then it seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong, is, the the architectural choices can either put a a communication boundary outside the the nucleus of the team on something that has to be done all the time so you have like um yeah. high chatter or orchestrate the boundary so that when we have to go outside the team to that functional specialist it's a less chatty communication uh pipeline so so that we're not waiting or we're not blocked so many times because we had to have some communication outside the, the team Absolutely. nucleus. Is that the, the concept? Absolutely. In fact, I, I think let's take it even one step further. Yeah, and the, the best low chatter one is like no chatter. Like here's your API, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And uh, if you use the API correctly, uh, right? Uh, there's no ticket. There's no request, right? It's like you get to use it, you know, on demand. Uh, and just imagine, you know, for, for the uh, developer, for the consumer, it is, um, you know, enables focus, flow, and even joy, right? As opposed to pestering someone for eight weeks to try to get, you know, something that you need to get, you know, your stuff done, right? Which is like you know, kind of a frustrating place to be. And that's really the premise of the Unicorn Project. Um, but, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example that sort of came to mind. I was laughing as you were asking the question. I think uh, one of the, uh, I think it was the Thanksgiving holiday a couple years ago. Okay. Um, one of the, it, it was a, Illuminating. Um, I, I decided to spend uh, the Thanksgiving weekend or week learning about Java logging. I had, uh, we, had okay. we were talking beforehand, right? That uh, you know, my favorite programming language is Clojure, and it runs on the JVM. Yeah. But I was never a Java programmer, right? So I found all of Java logging to be Log just a huge <laughs> mystery, yeah. right? Log for J, yeah. SL for J, um, you know, uh, utils, you know, Java util logging, right? Like, yeah. don't know, don't care, but at a certain point, you just at some point, you need to understand how to get it working right. <laughs> right. So I spent, you know, uh, four days learning a lot of stuff that I didn't really care that much about, but I did care about getting blogging working. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of that, it was just, it was the uh, it was a couple months before Log4j, you know, the big uh, uh, exploit. But really, you know, to me, it was ridiculous that I was learning this um, on my own. I just wish. Like, you know, my cloud vendor or somebody just said, here is how, if you want your output to show up here, here's mm -hmm. all you have to do to copy it in, right? And just have enough understanding of like, yeah. you know, if it's not showing up there, what could be going wrong? Anyway, so 
consider like uh, if I could wave a magic wand, I would have been a part of an organization where there was just a sample app. I could just copy <laughs> right. you know, just exactly what to write. And then I click on this link and that's where I'll find my log output. Like, mm -hmm. um, I think that is uh, an example of uh, enabling services that create independence of action so that people can just focus on what they want to focus on. Right, without having to do a lot of communication and coordination and cajoling and politicking and escalating you know, to get what they need. Many thanks to our podcast sponsor, Clear Measure. Clear Measure is a software architecture company that empowers clients' development teams to be self sufficient, moving fast, delivering quality, and running their systems with confidence. Whether starting a new project or developing new technologies or techniques, Clear Measure sets up your team to deliver world class results. Learn more at www.clearmeasure.com. Clear Measure, empowering software delivery. Clear Measure is also happy to be a sponsor of the video podcast, Programming with Palermo. Watch, learn, and program alongside Chief Architect Jeffrey Palermo. Videos are added weekly and available on syndicated locations supporting video podcast or by visiting palermo.network. Tune in today. It's interesting as you say that. You're right, simplification. The big tool vendors, and Microsoft being one of them, and open source authors, it's almost like there's a, a force to make it the next level more flexible or add the <laughs> next new capability with a configuration switch. And, you know, there's always somebody off to the side saying, well, wait a minute, it doesn't support this. You know, you need to <laughs> add this other. And so you end up with a hugely configurable tool that could do a bunch of stuff only if you know all the switches. Right. And for the for the 80% use case, the prominence of the 80% use case is demoted to the same level as all these tiny <laughs> little specific features instead of 80% use case. And then, by the way, if you want to do the other stuff, okay, you can opt out of the yeah. easy button, and now you can have access to all the switches. Right, right. With, uh, like, no fuss. In fact, can, can I share with you kind of like the uh, kind of the pathological case of, like, uh, what happens when you make it impossible, like you apply the opposite principle to everything? Yeah, please. <laughs> so um, a group of friends and I, we wrote a position paper called uh, the Checkbox Project. It was sort of a kind of a riff off of the Phoenix Project. But uh, imagine you're part of a, a mobile telco uh, where the one of the top five initiatives is to present a checkbox to your 20 million users so they can opt into a $5 a month service to get you know email or watch movies or so forth. Um, the problem is, is that you have to get this done. You have to transit across 40 different teams, mm -hmm. across four different customer uh, channels, right? So digital store support, et cetera. Um, it requires CEO minus one level support, daily war room meetings, $28 million, one year. And the bad part is, is that most people give it a 20% chance of succeeding. Because why? Because the last three times they tried it, didn't work, <laughs> you know, failed, right? And so... <laughs> Now, here's an example where, you know, the checkbox, right, to dramatically oversimplify, is not a very technically challenging problem at layers yeah. one or layer two. Uh, what this is, is that this is all, uh, the difficulty is all around communication and coordination and trying to get all these pieces to work uh, towards a common goal. Mm -hmm. um, and what it means, uh, you know, the term I've used is, you know, independence of action. You know, does can teams work independently to get done what they need to get done without having to deal with 35 different outside dependencies where you need their cooperation <laughs> and consent yeah, to right. get things done. Right. And so I think that'll be very familiar to architects, um, you know, because it, uh, you know, that's definitely a, uh, a, a, a goal that we want to achieve, but you know, I think, you know, the countermeasures to that are things like exactly what we're talking about, where uh, it's about enabling self-service it's about enabling, you know, uh, platforms, you know, so that, you know, uh, these functional specialists can enable their teams to get done what they need to get done, that they mm -hmm. don't need to worry about what it is, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that allows them to uh, um, uh, focus on radically different areas of concern, right? But uh, achieve the most important goals of the organization. Uh, how, how am I doing? Yeah. That, that, that's good. I want to get your your opinion on the, the kind of trend that I think started maybe in the 80s or 90s with the with the microcomputer and then having a computer yeah. on every desk and as they got more complicated all the techie people 
formed a new department. We call mm. it the IT department, right? But the IT department hasn't been around in business for <laughs> you know for a hundred years. It's relatively you know a new phenomenon, and and then we have all these problems with separation because all the IT people are in somehow in a different department, <laughs> but we're trying to serve the department that they used to be in decades ago. So just as you project into the future, is the concept of the IT department going to be like a period of time in history where it's, or is it, is it a good idea? Mm. Is it, is the concept of an IT department a good idea or a bad idea, or should it just be, you know, everybody deployed to the operational (laughs) departments and just be serving them directly? You know, um, what a great question. Of course, the answer is it depends, right? But the most important thing is what does it depend upon? And yeah. I think we actually uh, you know, put together a uh, kind of a firm point of view on that. Uh, and I think it's best answered in this kind of uh, this metaphor about two people moving a couch. If, uh, so can I give you like a two and a half yeah. minute performance Good. art about that? <laughs> so let's imagine uh, two people moving a couch. Let's call them Steve and Gene. And so you might laugh at this activity because it's all, uh, you know, brawn work. There's no brain work uh, needed, right? Um, but it turns out, like, Stephen Gene actually have to solve a bunch of non-obvious problems. Like, where exactly is the center of gravity um, mm-hmm. to get through a narrow doorway around which axis do they rotate? Uh, yeah. To get down a narrow winding set of stairs, who goes first? And they should they face forward or backwards? And mm-hmm. so you don't need a lot of consultants or focus groups. Just by picking up the couch, trial and error, experimentation, but most importantly, coordination and communication, right? We can have some confidence that Steve and Gene will, you know, uh, achieve their goal. But there's all these things that we can do as leaders to make their work more difficult, right? So we can turn off all the lights, right? Which means mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> the work can be more dangerous, will take longer, they might damage the couch, the rooms, or maybe even themselves. But um, another dimension that we can uh, make the work more difficult is we introduce a lot of background noise, like uh, loud music, a siren. Or we can even introduce an intermediary that prevents Steve and Gene from talking directly to each other, mm-hmm. uh, like making them go through, you know, Jira tickets and, you know, uh, you know, work orders and maybe account managers and lawyers, right? And so under those conditions, right, we can quickly imagine a scenario where like Steve and Gene will not achieve the goal, right? Because uh, the their need to, uh, what needs to be communicated so far outstrips the bandwidth that's been afforded to them. And I think that's actually what caused, uh, you know, the 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 DevOps moment, right? Where like there's no amount of fields in uh, the ticketing system that you know can accommodate just how much information needs to be communicated and shared between the dev and ops mm-hmm. group, right? And so, yeah. um, uh, and I think that's what really wasn't common between you know the uh, healthcare emergency departments, DevOps, security and ops. You know, for me, you know, 20 years ago, um, and so it just really, I think any architect will immediately you know say that this is really a metaphor for two critical concepts. One is uh, coherence, right? To what degree are Steve and Gene able to work as a coherent whole, right? Mm-hmm. And when you put an intermediary in, you know, they're not a whole, right? They, they are isolated in their own silos. And the other one is coupling. And I just loved how Kent Beck uh, addressed this in the interview that you did with him, right? Is that, um, you know, Steve and Gene are coupled together through the couch. What affects Steve affects Gene mm-hmm. and vice versa. And and so um, in the platform teams, right, uh, there's sometimes when we want very close coupling, right, with dev and ops, we need them coupled together because <laughs> it's hard to do good work, um, you know, without it. Uh, but there, um, what we do in software architecture is we try to decouple things uh, because um, when you have 3,000 people all coupled together, no one can get what they need to get done. It'll be, it's like the checkbox project, right? You need communication, coordination, approvals, prioritization, you know, sequencing, right? And you have 3,500 people all coupled to one couch. And so like the whole practice of like microservices, you know, platform engineering is we're trying to separate those concerns, right? To liberate mm-hmm. independence of action. Yeah. Let somebody uh, else bring down the cushions. Yeah, right. No, no, totally. Right. Which uh, it, it creates so much uh, value and, and it liberates people's ability to contribute. So I love the explanatory power of that. Because we can take that same metaphor, right? Amazon, 2001, right? Uh, 3,000 people all coupled together. You know, they went from being able to do hundreds of deployments per year, went down to tens of deployments per year, right? And so, you know, what they do about that was the famous Jeff Bezos memo where thou shalt only communicate through APIs. Um, And it was essentially chopping up that couch into small pieces so that 
you know, they could work independently of each other. And so 10 years later, they're doing 136,000 deployments a day, right? Okay, love it. That's one uh, way to uh, that the couch can explain that. But I love the Amazon Prime video example that came out two years ago that said they went from microservices back to a monolith and reduced the cost by 95%. Mm-hmm. And I love that because it's as if they chopped up the couches into two small pieces, right? Because now you're all the effort is around coordination and transport, right? Yeah. So uh, uh, by gluing it all back together, right, you reestablish locality and coherence, right? And so uh, you're not copying files in and out of storage buckets, right? It's now just at hand. And so, yeah. um, sorry, just uh, to uh, answer your great question. So, you know, under what conditions do you want kind of a centralized group of engineers? Um, versus do you, where do you want it sort of more closely embedded, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, users, businesses, and so forth. It's like, well, mm-hmm. it, it depends, <laughs> right? But now we know what it depends on, you know, who needs to talk most closely to whom and how important is that, uh, right? And, you know, the more you need joint co-creation uh, mm-hmm. with high levels of uncertainty, right? That's yeah. going to push you towards decentralization. But, uh, you know, it is, uh, for things like maybe SAP for, uh you know, basic financial processes like accounts payable. Well, <laughs> you should probably want that centralized, right? Uh, because those patterns are so well known. Um, yeah. Uh, how, how, might, how does that resonate with your own uh, beliefs? Well, yeah, it's less about beliefs and more of just uh, searching, searching for the right sweet spot as opposed to just be a pendulum swing of, of you know, reactions. Yeah. And I, I just observe marketing uh, organizations getting fed up with internal IT and then they go and hire an outside agency. Why? Because yeah. <laughs> the outside agency has programmers. And, they don't want to yeah. and so some, you know, some departments is just like, okay, I'm, I'm going to figure out how to get my own programmers. So yeah. um, I don't think that, I don't think it's a rule of thumb for everybody, but it's a good way to, yeah, it's a good way to just think and ask that question. Hey, can I give you like one other example that I just found so startling? Um, and so like we're all playing around with generative AI uh, and it's just, it's so it's amazing. I haven't had this much fun in like decades. A friend of mine, Dr. Mick Kirsten, he wrote the book Project to Product and uh, we were having a conversation. I just literally, he said something and I stopped my tracks because it was so startling to me. Um, and so basically what he said was, you know, they have something called like a plan view co-pilot, right? The idea that... Uh, um, and you know, the notion was that they, uh, he went from kind of a decentralized kind of group of, um, um, gen AI prompt engineering group mm-hmm. to centralizing. And, and so why it's because that, um, he was alarmed that, um, you know, they're experimenting with moving some workloads from like using, uh, GPT-4 to Claude. But the problem was that the prompt engineering practices were so varied that they had inadvertently coupled themselves, you mm. know, to a specific frontier model, right? And so, which is a terrible place to be. Like when things are changing this quickly, you want to bring that switching cost down to zero, right? Yeah, but, right. So my question was, like the API shapes are the same. What do you mean? <laughs> you know, well, you can't switch from one to the other. And he said that the prompt engineering practices were so varied that, you know, basically it would be a heavy lift across basically, you know, every major product group. And so uh, the goal was to actually re-centralize those functions so that, you know, and have all the prompts live in one repo, right? So that you could have a group that was responsible for, you know, potentially uh, painlessly migrating from one uh, frontier LLM to another. Mm-hmm. And so it's just interesting because all the symptoms sound very familiar. Uh, and yet, you know, the, the way they manifest are very different, but it's all about coupling, right? And, right. and so even in the age of LLMs, right, where uh, it's not about API compatibility, but it's about something else where you want sort of like the ability to have optionality to switch from one to the other. Uh, how am I doing? Right. It's like coupling more on the people side than technology. It's how much people have to communicate and work together. Right. And uh, or Or like, it's like the groups knew too much about, the other side of the LLM interface, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, it's, uh, it's right. EP4 versus, you know, uh, versus, you know, Claude 3, whatever. Right, right. Your microservice example of going microservices and then come back <laughs> to a monolith, that story is getting told <laughs> over and over again with all these people that are going full on microservices and then realizing, oh, no, okay, now we don't like something about it, and then they come back together. I mean, Microsoft did that with uh, uh, Azure DevOps um, and um, and the, the mono repository pattern. But I wonder if, I wonder if 
if it's a different vector, that's the problem. Yeah. The, the monolith, it's been around for a long time. We can't move fast with it. And we think, you know what? Separate Git repositories is the answer. Microservices. <laughs> so let's forcibly, let's split up where the code is stored, which forces us to have independent builds, independent tests, independent deployments, independent configuration, independent yeah. you know, operations. It forces us to actually fix the problems that we wouldn't fix as a monolith. But then, of course, we don't like how expensive it is to run and some of these other problems. So we're like, ah, yeah. you know yeah. what? Let's see if we can put it back together. But when it's put <laughs> back together, we're, because we've learned it, we're able to preserve the better build patterns, the better yeah. pull requests and branching and testing and better, you know, the logical boundaries that we've put yeah. in there. And now we have a monolith again, but it's actually a better architected monolith. And we're actually able to move fast and quickly because we actually learned how to do a good monolith. Yeah. That resonates a hundred percent to me, and it shows, you know, uh, so in, in our book, we have this, uh, the notion that kind of the layer three systems must be isomorphic to layer one and layer two. Right? And so, you know, Conway's law is probably a part of that, right? Where um, uh, what, you, what you just said is that, you know, by partitioning, you know, the Git repos, it forces <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and, and when certain microservice components can't talk to another it forces yep. you know a change in, in layers one and layer two uh ab absolutely right um and what you just said is that you can do that without actually having to you know uh uh force uh you know specific code to live in different say containers <laughs> right uh 100 percent. that right. absolutely resonates with me so perhaps the people who've gone through that journey and now know what a a well-architected large system in a single Git repository can look like the next system that, that they built from scratch, they'll put those things in place from the beginning and then might end up with a one Git repository system that where they can still do many deploys a day. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that uh, is totally consistent with my uh, own, you know, observations and experiences. And by the way, I, I think maybe, uh, this actually we didn't put in the book, but uh, Dr. Ron Westrom, uh, he introduced me to this term of uh, the socio-technical maestro. And he said these kind of great leaders, they have five, these five characteristics. They're great. Uh, they have high energy, high standards, great in the large, great in the small, and they love walking the floor. And mm -hmm. when I heard that, it was just it just hit me like a ton of bricks. Like that's exactly you know uh, resonates with my own. Um, experiences and how I assess like, you know, um, you know, how good of a, a leader is right. And, you know, leaders at all layers is they have this uh, sensibility of what are the conditions that allow people to do their work easily and well. And, uh, you know, I think the language that gives us so many of the tools to describe it come from software architecture, right. It is really uh, about, you know, to what degree, you know, where are the logical boundaries? hard mm -hmm. or soft, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, for the purpose of isolation, but also independence of action, right? You know, to enable people uh, to do their work without a lot of, without a lot of communication coordination. And uh, you know, just to belabor the obvious, uh, that was a finding that came out in 2017 in the state of research saying that, you know, one of the top predictors of performance was software architecture. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that was all Jez Humble's work. And uh, that really taught me a lot about uh, what, good architecture looked like, but I got to tell you, working with uh, Steve Spear, really trying to understand like, okay, I feel like I now finally understand like what coupling and co coherence <laughs> really are all about. And it's not just about software architecture, it's about any system yeah. where you have, you know, uh, multiple groups that need to work together. Right, right, right. Well, I man, this interview could go on for several more hours. <laughs> I just want to encourage the listeners to read your latest book, uh, wiring a um, you know winning organization and of course all the past ones as well but as we as we kind of wrap up here for people who want to you know dig in further and uh, and learn more in this area of organizational leadership are there any final tips uh, that you would impart them with oh my gosh yeah i would uh, say that you know working on this book was the most intellectually challenging thing i've ever worked on in my entire career but also one of the most rewarding i feel like i can spend the rest of my career really um understanding kind of what it means to uh, use these 
uh, principles and these mechanisms. Um, and I, I guess I just continue to be blown away by how important uh, the notion of independence of action is. In fact, uh, we're running a uh, conference that you had mentioned, the Enterprise Technology Leadership Summit uh, in uh, at the end of August. Uh, and I would say a, th a third to a half of the talks are about uh, this, what, what the power that you know this creates. Um, there's a talk from uh, uh, Vanguard about uh, you know oh, <laughs> all the bad things that happen when you have these batch jobs that run and you can't stop, and they have this mm. blast radius that potentially impacts everybody. Yeah. And what can be created when you can actually pause them or split them up by you know, running them in like little, at lambdas? Mm -hmm. that, it too creates independence of action. It now allows certain categories of problems to be solved, not by the engineering manager, but by the product manager, right? <laughs> uh, there's a talk from uh, Austin Puckett from Clear about uh, uh, doing the same thing so that airport operations, uh, you know, lane managers can make decisions without having uh, to be coupled to the engineering mm -hmm. uh, teams, right? And allowing people to make decisions close to the edge. I mean, it's just it's so great. And so uh, if you're interested in that, uh, just go to uh, look at Enterprise Technology Leadership Summit. And I just continue to learn and marvel at, you know, just how important of a uh, sensibility it is for to have leaders understand, like, what does it take to wire their organizations well? And just to see how many dimensions of value they can create, you know, not just for the technology team, but for the organization they serve. Amazing. Wow. Wow. That's a lot. That's great. That's <laughs> great. That's great. Gene? Thank you so much for coming on the Azure DevOps podcast and, and sharing you know, your uh, vast and, and long tenured experience wiring a winning software organization. I really appreciate the, the conversation. Jeffrey, right back at you. Keep up the amazing work, and I very much look forward to meeting you in person one of these days. Uh, likewise, likewise. Thank you so much. And until next time, keep shipping. You've been listening to the Azure DevOps Podcast, a show for developers and DevOps professionals shipping software using Microsoft technologies. Go to www.azuredevops.show for show notes and other episodes. On behalf of your host, Jeffrey Palermo, and our sponsors, thanks for listening, and may God bless you.